The devil is a professional loser. You are anointed to win. Welcome to the Whoop the Devil podcast. Here's your host, Corey Scarlett. Write in the comments for me. Stay ready. Stay ready. And um, there's a bug in here. But anyways, we'll just let him be. He can be a special guest. Um, <laughs> so stay ready. We're gonna. Re- I'm gonna talk about eight lessons real quick that you can learn from Gideon. The story of Gideon. You can find the story of Gideon in Judges chapter six and seven. Basically, two chapters. There's a little bit about him in chapter eight, and then it kind of switches gears. But um, there, this is a great story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, you know, looking back, there's so much in it that you can teach from because there's so many lessons you can learn. So, yes, once again, I'm returning with the Bible verses on the bottom of the screen. So let's do it. So if you would. Turn to Judges chapter 6 or just read along with your boy. Okay. So, um, a little background. Actually, this will give you the background, so I won't even go there. Let me just let me just let it let it. Let's just read it. Judges 6. If you know anything about Judges, that chapter of the Bible, so basically you had or that book of the Bible, excuse me. You had Moses leading the Israelites into the promised land, but because of of their unbelief, they did a recycle of people, and and those 20 and older, they they died out in the 40 years that they went back into the wilderness. They came back to the promised land, and now Joshua and Caleb's family and um, anyone 19 and older at the time of the when they, when they said we can't enter the promised land because of the giants, uh, anyone 19 and younger and their families, they were able to enter. So they come in, they enter, and Joshua, you get the whole book of Joshua, where Joshua basically, he takes the promised land. He's the new leader of the Israelites. However, generations after Joshua forgot their God and started serving other gods and got into trouble. And you'll see this cycle basically um, go through in the book of Judges where um, they forget, Israel forgets God, and then they get oppressed, they get taken over by another land, and then they cry out to God. And then God sends them a judge and a way of victory. So these judges, they didn't have kings yet, but they would appoint these judges that would be like the leader, uh, and God would use them. And then, uh, yeah, Joshua was, Joshua, I love the book of Joshua because basically you read the first chapter of Joshua, God says, we're going to go take this land and as long as you stay with me and obey the word and tell you, do what I've commanded you to do, you're going to walk in everything I've promised you and no one will be able to stand against you. You're going to go in there and take it. And uh, there's only one hiccup and I could do a whole thing on that where there was sin in the camp. And they uh, got they lost the battle, and then that got fixed, and then Joshua kept pushing forward. At the end of Joshua's life, he says, "Hey, do not start worshiping those other gods again. Remember your God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." That's where that comes from, Joshua. And he, and he said, "Remember your God. Remember the God of Israel. Don't start worshiping these idols and things like that, because then you'll get in major trouble." Well, Judges is when they got in major trouble. But when they cried out to God and they humbled themselves and they repented, God would send somebody to help them. But in there, they would get relaxed and they would feel like they had it all together. So here comes, God's going to send another judge to help, or or here comes, excuse me, when they get lax in their worshiping of God and they start allowing, they start allowing false idols and other um, gods to be worshiped, then these people would come in and take over. So there was this cycle. That was going on in the book of Judges. Now we see, um, you'll see this phrase right here at the beginning. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. You see that a lot. And then they get oppressed. They open a door for the enemy to come in, literally. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. So these Midianites, 
came in, took over seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. So they would hide out. They were scared to death of these people. It wasn't just that they took over the land, but they were, you know, so cruel to the people they had to hide. Okay? Next verse, verse 3. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the, the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. So they planted. As soon as they planted, they like dug up the, the seeds and, and ruined everything that they had worked hard for. And then um, they also took all their meat, sheep, goats, cattle, donkeys, all those things, all the livestock. Let's go to verse 5. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. That's how thick they rolled they rolled deep with a lot of people all right they arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count you couldn't count the camels and they stayed until the land was stripped bare so they came in like a, just a, a flood of people and and just raided the whole thing and there was, there was nothing so israel was reduced to starvation by the midianites then the israelites cried out to the lord for help so it took all that for them to cry out to the lord When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Look, what we're not listening to God will get you in trouble. Write that in the comments. Not listening to God will get you in trouble. It's clearly stated there. That was the reason why they were attacked, right? Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah's. On, on the Oprah show. No, I'm just kidding. At Oprah. You know, they say that uh, that was how um, Oprah's mom wanted to spell her name, but she, she was actually trying to say that word, but she didn't know how to spell it right. Which belonged to Joash and the clan of Ab Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. All right, there's something we need to know there. He, so he's in a hole. He's in the bottom of a wine press threshing wheat. What, what is such a big deal about threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press? Well, that was not supposed to be done underground. Okay. It was supposed to be done out in the open because the wind, what, when they thresh wheat, they throw it in the air and the wind blows away the chaff and the actual grain lands. So what happens is they would toss that in the air and the wind would blow it. There's no wind if he's in the bottom of a wine press, so he's not even getting the, the best out of what he's trying to do, uh, getting the grain out. He's hiding in a hole from these Midianites, okay? So let's continue with the scriptures. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and, say, and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I'm going to stop there for a second because I want to give some points. So what do we have? Israel did evil in God's sight. Here comes the Midianites to take over. For seven years straight, they would come and steal their harvest, mess up their, their crops. They were, they were so thick, they came like a flood, and they wouldn't leave until it was stripped, bare, and everything was gone. So the Israelites were hiding in caves and mountains, and Gideon is threshing wheat in a hole, basically, which you're not supposed to even be doing. And the Midianites, they represent a spirit of intimidation and fear and, and domination, destruction, discouragement, control, all these things represented in what the Midianites are doing, and those are things that the enemy does to the believer. He's an intimidator. He wants to strike fear. There's a spirit of fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. So it says there can be a spirit that causes fear. Domination and control, that is an antichrist type spirit. And this is what they were doing, destroying Israel. Gideon was scared. He's hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat, hiding for his life, hiding his food, 
hiding his work is his his survival he's in there trying to survive we're not called to just survive as believers we are called to thrive and live victoriously but the oppression was so bad that the entire group of people everybody was hiding out everybody was hiding and they were cry they had to cry out to god because of the starvation they had no hope but god to come through and help them here and they were scared to go out because they don't know the Midianites might be on the other side. So we're going to get into point one here. Point number one, lessons from Gideon. Believe who God said you are. Write that in the comments. Believe who God said you are. I'm pulling that verse up again real quick. The 12th verse, the last one on there. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He's hiding out in a hole. And God is calling him through this angel, is speaking this word to him that says, Mighty hero. Other translations say, Mighty warrior, mighty man of valor, brave man. This is the this is what they he was saying. Brave and mighty were the opposite of what Gideon was. He's hiding. He's scared for his life. He was also the least important person in his family. He's the youngest from in his family. We'll read this in a second. And his family was the weakest tribe in all of Manasseh, in the tribe of Manasseh. But here's the thing. God doesn't see you how you see yourself. God sees greatness in you. Write that in the comments. God sees greatness in me. God sees greatness in me. That's why God speaks things in his word that seem so ridiculous to believe and so uh, incredible if they would come true in your life. There's, you're almost like there's no way this could happen if you think logically, but that's where faith comes in and that's where trusting God's word comes in. So you have to believe God's word and what God says about you more than what other people say about you, more than what that mirror says about you that you're looking at in the morning when you feel butt ugly, but God said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. More than um, what you're going through, more than what you think about yourself, more than things that have defined you in the past, God's word has to be more true. You have to believe those things. So think about it. What is holding you back? What's the thing that's holding you back now? If, if, if there's somewhere you want to go uh, moving forward and somewhere you know in your life and mentally and spiritually and, and even manifesting in the natural realm with your family and your business and your ministry or wherever you're at in life, what's holding you back? Is, the, is fear holding you back? Is insecurity holding you back? Is insignificance? You feel like you're not really uh, worth much. Is there shame? Is there guilt? Is there sin? When are you going to decide, I'm going to believe God's word. I'm going to believe. He said, I'm mighty. Just like he told Gideon. He said, you're a mighty man of valor. If you're watching right here, you're a mighty man. You're a mighty woman. You're a great hero for God. You are victorious through his strength and what Jesus Christ did. So you've got to decide those things are not going to defeat you anymore. And you'll believe God's word over whatever else you're facing in life right now. You can be who God says you can be and what you this is a big revelation for a lot of people because God says a lot of great things about you amazing things about you in his word amazing promises in his word but who God says you are will not matter to you until you decide to believe it I'm gonna say it again who God says you are will never matter to you until you decide to believe it. He can say all kinds of great things, and he already has. But until you make up in your heart, I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to speak that, and I'm going to act on it and act like it's true because I believe God's word is more true than my circumstance, and I'm going to live this life of faith. Not by sight, but by faith is how I'm going to live. And when you, when you get a hold of that, then... All his promises you'll start seeing come to pass in your life. But you can you can hear it all day. You can read it all day. You can 
have people pray it over you all day. But until you believe it, it won't matter to you. So number one was that you've got to believe who God said you are. Now, number two, let me get into it. You got to quit playing the blame game. Put that in the comments. Quit playing the blame game. What does that mean? Look what Gideon did once God said that. Sir, Gideon replied, once the, he's the angel speaking for God here. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. So he's blaming God for all these things he's going through. He said, where are all the miracles? You know, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Where are you, God? Why has all this happened to us? And he's blaming God for what's going on. And many people blame God for what they're facing when the, the actual results of what they're facing is consequence of their own bad decision making. You're reaping what you sown. And, and people, they want to blame God, but it ain't God's fault. Sometimes it's from the enemy. Sometimes it's from other people. It's things outside of you that you can't control. Sometimes it's the results of your own poor choices. Sometimes it's the results of poor choices of your parents and you've been handed down these things. Sometimes it's the results of poor, poor choices from your spouse. Some, you know, it, it, it's, it can come from other sources, but he's talking to God. He's arguing with God here about this situation and he's blaming God. Let's read what else he says here. So, then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. The Lord, he ain't got no time for this. He said, no, I'm going to get go with the strength you have and rescue them. I, and, and he already, you know, the Lord already explained why. Through the angel, let's go back a couple of verses. Uh, the, through the prophet that said uh, back in verse um, 9 and 10, he says or that they are verse 10. He said, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites whose land you now live. But you didn't listen to me. And that's when it came upon them. Right. So Gideon is arguing back and forth. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? What? Oh, poor me. Right. The Lord turns to him and says. Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? Another excuse. He's making excuses, right? My clan, he's blaming his family now. He's blaming his roots. He's blaming his past. You don't, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, you don't know where I came from. You don't know my situation. You've never dealt with people like this. You've never, you don't know, you know. It doesn't matter. Your past cannot define who you are. And that we're going to get a little bit more into that in a second. But he said, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my entire family. Continuing to make these excuses. and he said, But the Lord says to him, actually, let me go back. We won't go there yet. Let me stay on that point. So he's, he's arguing debating with God, blaming God for what happened with the people of Israel, making excuses why he couldn't be the one to go for battle. He, he played the blame game. He has the victim mentality, which is a, the worst mentality you can have. Victim mentality is rampant in our country, and it is rampant because politics rule this country, and we live in a place where... Um, there are certain politicians that play on people's victim mentalities and they want to be their savior and they want to be their solution and come to us and we'll give you this and we'll give you that. And the reason why you are the way you are is no, not any of your fault. It's bad systems. You know, the real, there really is, not to get political, but this bleeds into everything um, that we, we face, especially in this nation. Um, and it is based on biblical principles. There are two schools of thought. And if you look at the party platforms of, uh, you know, you have obviously the two big parties, Republican and Democrat. One side believes that the um, 
at its core that the systems are corrupt and that is the reason why people are not bad they're not bad people and people are not bad at heart so if we can just fix the system we can get better government and better programs and things like this that'll fix everybody when the other side at its core now they have a little it's, they're a little blended together uh, on some of these things but at its core believes that people genuinely have bad intentions so we need to provide laws that encourage good behavior and punish bad behavior versus and and that's not that is not on the uh we know people are going to do bad regardless of the system you cannot fix it because people are just sinful at heart and that's that's a bit more of a biblical worldview people are sinful they're going to do evil they want to do evil the bible says it even paul was talking about my flesh wants to do this these things that are evil right and um so we as christians know that what's going to fix people is to go after their hearts and change their hearts you cannot change a system and make everybody perfect you know that is that's what communism believes that you can one day get to a utopian perfect society and we've seen where that's ended up because people are imperfect people cannot they cannot go that direction they they cannot like uh uh they cannot be perfect so um, because we have sin in us. So, anyways, let me keep going. Stop playing the blame game. Even if you win, let me think about this. If you win the blame game, if you're in an argument with somebody, right, and you win that blame game, you win that argument, what if God said that was right? What if God told Gideon, yeah, you're right, you know, I haven't helped y'all out any. And, and, and uh, guess what? Still, if you win an argument with somebody, you were blaming somebody, you win that argument. Thank you. Apostle, um, if you win the argument, you still got an unresolved problem. If you won the blame game, the problem is still there. If if Gideon, if God would have conceded to Gideon, which God wouldn't, because then he would not be telling the truth. But if he would said, "All right, all right, Gideon, I'll give it to you. I haven't helped y'all out like I should have," uh, um, uh, you know. But still, we still have a problem with the Midianites that needs fixed. Even if you win the blame game of your personal life. That the reason why you're struggling so bad in poverty and in um, in your relationships, in uh, in walking holy, is because you know your family was a wreck, and you had alcoholics in your family, and you had adulterers in your family, you had all these uh, this craziness that you came out of, right? It, even if you win that blame, even if that is right, and you win the blame game, and they are to blame, you still have a problem you have to deal with. So the blame game doesn't do anything. It's just making excuses. But you can either make excuses or you can make something happen. And everyone has some kind of excuse. They could blame something. But you know what? Once you come to Christ, I don't believe you have any more excuses for why you're not living the way you should, for not, why you're not walking in victory. You should decide, you know what? God said these things about me. I'm going to believe them. Back to point one that I said, I'm going to believe they are true. I'm going to act on them in faith. And I'm going to keep pushing. You're not responsible for the sins of your past or your family sins or what someone else did to you, but you are responsible for how you respond. You are responsible for how you respond. What will be your response? Because when God saved you, he called and equipped you not to live as a victim anymore, but to live as a victor and to destroy the work of Satan. So God's not your problem, God's your solution. Write that in the comments. God's not my problem, God's my solution. God's not my problem, God's my solution. And you look, this, this broadcast sponsored by Sonic. Why was those things happening? It's clearly spelled out. Israel opened the door because of sin and disobedience. They got their priorities off of God and started allowing mixture and dysfunction and idol worship and sin to come into their land and before long boom they were taken over people open doors to evil and reap the consequence of sin it's very simple but there's a place you can get into with god where you're no longer hiding from satan and running in fear of from from the the power of sin and and these things you're facing but you're hidden in God. 
living with no fear. He's your refuge, living with no hesitation. He's your security, and you can stand strong in him. God has anointed you to not live under excuses, but to be a fighter and to fight the good fight of faith. He's appointed you and anointed you and called you to destroy the work of Satan. You're anointed to win. You're, you're anointed to win every time. I don't care if you're the least likely. I don't care if you're the smallest. I don't care if you're the poorest. I don't care if, if you're the last candidate they would choose to do these things. Just like Gideon, he was the smallest. He was the, he was the least in his family. But God still chose him to do a great thing. You're no longer part of your family anymore. You are part of God's family. You're not part of a, of a family that has done, um, maybe treated you wrong in the past and, and you have a bloodline of, of evil things in your generations. You are part of the family of God. Now let's go to point number three. Me, well, let's see. Let's put it this way. Put me plus God Let's see if y'all can find some of these uh, these symbols for me. I'm going to write it in the comments for you. Me plus God is greater than the any problem. Look at that. There's some math for you. I wrote it in the comments for you. Me plus God is greater than any problem. Let's look at what happened here. That is the right symbol, right? I, I used to always forget which one. <laughs> the greater than and less than. All right. Verse 16, Judges 6, 16. The Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. He's going to look like he's stronger than that entire army that was like a flood of locusts that had too many camels to count. And camels are pretty big now. I saw a video on TikTok today of a camel making whatever noise a camel makes. So... It's a little strange sounding. I won't do it because it might scare some people. So we ain't going to do that. He is greater than all. You're right. And you know what? You and God are the majority. You can write that in there too. You and God are the majority. Yeah, the alligator. I remember that example too. <laughs> uh, you and God are the majority. He said, I will be with you. And that was enough. I will be with you. And then... Um, I won't get into uh, the, I'm going to skip around a little bit. There's a lot you can get into with Gideon. I'm not even getting into the fleece thing. I'm not going there today. And I'm going to give you eight points. So, because um, that's a little controversial and it ain't really, I'm not saying it's not worth talking about, but not in where I'm going today. How about that? So how many people does it take to make a change? You and God. That's what it takes. You can be the majority. God can deliver by few or he can deliver by many. He doesn't need a crowd. He just needs a willing leader to step up. So you might be the willing leader that steps out of your whole family and makes a big change. Or you, and, and maybe they follow you or maybe they don't. Or maybe it's years down the line where they're calling you and saying, hey, I need your help. I need you to pray for me. I, I want to know Jesus. But you had to step out and be a willing leader. What's popular is rarely what's right. What's right is rarely what's popular. An army numbered as many as the sands on the seashore versus the smallest person from the smallest clan from a small nation of Israel at the time. And, and God said this. He said, I will be with you. And he's just talking to Gideon. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Wow. Wow. So all you need is God on your side. All you need, you don't, and I, I, I can't remember what great preacher said this, and if somebody knows, let me know. He, he used to start his broadcast uh, by saying, he's an old faith preacher. I, it's either R.W. Shambach or Lester Summerall. And he, he would say, you don't have any problems. You just need faith in God. 
So these problems are they they are not anything compared to your God. You gotta you gotta start thinking that way. So I'm gonna skip ahead a few verses here, but that's number three. You and God are always greater than your problem. Put uh, for number four. This is our number four point. My past is just fuel to my fire. My past is just fuel to my fire. It's not an excuse anymore. It's just fuel to my fire. Look at this. So, I'm going to skip ahead a few verses. Go to verse 24. Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Oprah at, at the Oprah show. No, I'm just kidding. I can't make Oprah jokes because nobody cares about Oprah anymore. In the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd and the one that is seven years old, pull down. Oh, so he, he, he wanted, God wanted an offering, but he also wanted this, pull down your father's altar to Baal. Gideon's father had an altar to Baal, the false god, and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Another uh, evil idol, right? Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on the hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using it as fuel, the wood using as fuel the wood of the asherah pole you cut down so he said you're going to use the idol the past your family's mistakes as just fuel to your fire to just say i'm never going to go back there i'm never going to or maybe mistakes of your past just personally i'm never going to live that life again that's how you have to let it be a fuel don't let it be an excuse to not live it for god let it be fuel to your fire no that's how it used to be and i'm gonna live the way god's called me to live so gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the lord commanded but he did it at night because he was afraid the other members of his father's household uh and the people in the, t in the town early the next morning the people of the town began to stir someone discovered that the altar of baal had been broken down and the asherah pole beside it had been cut down in their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. That was your fuel. And a lot of people have that testimony. God instructed him to take down the false god uh, Baal's idol and the Asherah poles from his father and use it for fuel to make a sacrifice. And the people tried to have him killed, but God protected him. Listen, you have to, because look at this next part. They were going to kill Gideon. People said to each other, who did this? After asking around and making a careful search, they learned it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of, t of the town demanded of Joash. And you'll get criticized from people from your past that don't like what you're doing. You're going to get criticized. You're going to get hated. You may even get done wrong by some people when you make a strong decision for God. He must die for destroying the, the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. You might have family that was deep in some nasty, sinful stuff. And when you decided to live for God, they didn't encourage it. They discouraged it. And they got mad and basically excommunicated you from the family. But that's what they were trying to do to Gideon here. But Joash, his father, shouted to the mob that confronted him. He said, why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal is truly, if Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. So he he just said, "All right, listen. If Baal's real, he can defend himself if he's a powerful god. If not, we'll find out." From then on, Gideon was called Jerubel, which means let Baal defend himself, because he had broke Baal's altar. And you might get a name that people start calling you because you stood up for God. And they might call you, I don't know, these are going to sound like the corniest names ever. Goody Two Shoes, a Holy Roller. Oh, you think you're holier than us. Oh, you think you're better than us. Look at Miss Thing. Look at Mr. Angel. Look at Jesus Christ himself walking. He thinks he's something. And people are going to pick on you. They do that. But you know what? Forget all that. God will protect you. It's more important to please God than it is to please man. 
he moved forward from the from the mistakes of his family's past. And even he might have been involved in that. We don't know. It doesn't just say that, but that was in his dad's house. The previous generation should be fuel that you're never going to be them. Use your previous mistakes as fuel that you're never going back and Jesus has redeemed you and you're moving forward. Stop aging us, please. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Number five, right? It ain't about me. It ain't about me. God wants the glory. So let's read this next part. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next chapter. So Jerubel, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. Herod. Her Herod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley of the hill of Moreh. Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they save themselves by their own strength. All right, look what he's saying. You got too many. If they win, the Israelites will boast that they did it on their own. All right. So if we can get out of wanting our own glory... God will do great things through us. If we can get out of trying to figure things out on our own and giving ourselves credit and, and then actually discrediting ourselves when something impossible or something too hard comes up, then God can do something with that because God opposes the proud, the Bible says. It means you literally go against God when you become proud. But he gives grace. That's his... His, um, in, it's an empowering grace that he will put on your life if you're humble. He gives grace to the humble. And God wants to get the world's attention and to show his glory through the ordinary, unqualified, unequipped, unworthy people. That's who he's looking for. He, he's, he looks for the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the Bible says. So don't discredit yourself because God will use you if you can humble yourself and not make it all about you and what you can do, but make it about what God can do through you. you got to be willing to um, persist and do something that takes faith, though. Because if you don't quit, you're not going to lose. If you keep pushing forward in faith with God, you're not going to lose the battle. He's going to go with you. But, you know, Gideon could have easily gave up and said, Oh, no, you want me to take people out of the army? But no, he trusted God uh, in, in his command and moved forward. So God wanted the glory there. Now, so that's, that's number five. You must be the most humble man on this planet. He gave you an extra portion of grace. Thank you. Uh, pretty good. All right. Good stuff. There's always good grace jokes when it comes to uh, me anytime we preach on grace. So number six, I have to stay alert. I have to stay alert. I don't know why I call this stay ready because it's literally just one of the points. <laughs> but I just needed something catchy. This is the point. <laughs> Judges 7, verse 4. Let's look. Or verse, let's go to verse 3. That God is telling him, all right, you got to get rid of some people. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this morning and go home. If you ain't about that life, get out of here, right? Um, he said, if go big or go home, no. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. So he started with 32,000 and he dropped it down. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. So look at this test that he does. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told them, divide the men into two groups. The ones who put all, are in one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. Okay, I won't demonstrate that. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the streams. So they're face down in the water. There's some that picked it up like this and drank out of it. There's some 
that got on their hands and knees and stuck their head in the water like an ostrich or something like that, right? Stick <laughs> so, only 300 of the men drank from their hands, and the others were down on their knees drinking with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with those 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Wow. So Gideon collected the provisions of ram's horns and other, of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept 300 of the men with them. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. That night the Lord said, get up, go down to the Midianite camp, for I have given you the victory over them. All right, let's look. Break this thing down. Why did he do that? The first set, so he eliminated some people. And, and this is what we cannot be. So the first set of 22, um, what was it? 22,000, or there was 32,000 men and 22,000 left. 22,000 of them, they said, if you're scared, go home. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. These people had the spirit of fear. They were intimidated. They were scared. They went home immediately. They said, if you're scared, you can go home. They just left. All right. Then the rest of them that said, I ain't never scared. I ain't never scared. Okay. They, God said, we still got to eliminate some of those guys. All right. So they got down to the, um, the water. And uh, what does it represent? They stuck their head down into the water and some of them cupped the, the water in their hands. Well, the ones that stuck their head down into the water, they had no chance to play, to, they could not look around them in battle. They were face first in the water, drinking the water. If you had it cupped up, you could drink it and look and still be prepared for battle. With face down, it represents people that are, you are face down in things that distract you and things that that uh you, you know you're self-centered you're only focused on yourself and getting that what will satisfy your flesh the water at the time was what would satisfy their flesh they're face down in there they're distracted they're, they were careless in the last days the bible says many will depart from the true faith when and when the when the going gets tough the tough get going but then we get going the other direction People are going to turn from the true faith. They're going to be so caught up in, in things that satisfy their flesh that they will turn around. They will turn from the faith. They will. I'm talking Christians that were part of the true faith will leave the faith. They got on their knees face first in the water, face first in the cares of life, face first in busyness, face first caught up in, you know, people that are caught up in work so much so they don't have time for the things of God. Caught up in, in, in so, so much in making money that they forgot who gave them the power to gain wealth. They caught up in every distraction possible, every escape possible, worldly things. And not even sinful things sometimes, just carnal thinking, which means you're just, you're not thinking spiritually. You're thinking about the things of this planet and these natural things more than you are focused on spiritual things. They're so busy and distracted that they miss out on God and what God's called them to be and what, they, what He's called them to do. They, you, if you're face down in the water, you're going you're gonna to be distracted when the enemy attacks. You're going to miss out on opportunities that God has for you. If you're just caught up in, in the carnal realm, you will never think about witnessing and sharing the gospel. And, and if God had you it was going to lead you to pray for somebody and help somebody, but you're so caught up in your own stuff, You'll never go out there and do anything with it. The issues in your own personal life that you need to deal with are manifesting and running your life and you're so caught up in it. You're face down in it. It's defining who you are and there's no protection. If it, The devil could attack at any time. The enemy could attack. You get hit, you're done. You're not ready for battle. You're, re you're just focused on you. And you're not ready for what God has called you to do. I mean, the ones who knelt and drank the water out of their hands, they were able to see what was going on. They were alert. They were paying attention. They were prepared for battle. God doesn't want to take your life away from you. He wants, you know, and you, I'm talking about being caught up in the cares of this world. He doesn't want to take your life away from you. But he, the Bible clearly says he wants to give you life. He came for the reason to give you life and life more abundantly. The Bible says he'll give you the desires of your heart. 
The Bible says all these great, he wants you to live a good life. He doesn't want you to be struggling, but he wants you to be alert and sober minded and not distracted. And so focused on the natural that we miss out on what's happening in the spirit realm. Let me see here. God, he, he wants you to enjoy life, but in a life that's focused on him. And everything that you do is tied around what God has called you to do and serving him and living in obedience to him. The Bible says a lot of things about being um, alert and not being distracted. The Bible says we got to prepare our minds for action. We got to be on, on guard for the enemy's attack. He goes around like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may he may devour. It says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Don't slip back into your old desires. It says, be on guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. 1 Peter 5.8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. And that's you giving him permission to devour you by not being alert, by not being sober minded. I mean, even literally when you come to the subject of drinking and and how about smoking at reefer? OK, because some people want to argue that that's OK now, too, or even pe whatever you do to dull your mind. It doesn't make you sober minded. It makes you dull minded. In Luke 21, 34, Jesus said this. Watch out. Speaking of the last days, and we're in those. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness. That's just like, what is carousing? That's just going to hang out and just do carnal things. Okay? It might not necessarily even be sinful. It's just hanging out. Just going about, worried about you. And having fun and all these things, and that's all you care about. And drunkenness. And by the worries of this life, don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times. And I pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. So you've got to stay alert. Write this. We got two more. Number seven. The majority is not necessary. The majority is not necessary. What did Jesus, what, what did the Lord say to Gideon in verse two? He said, you got too many warriors with you. I got to eliminate some because uh, I want to show that it, it's me winning the battle and not them by their strength. And then he, he, he's divided other people. You don't need a majority. You just need a few people or even just one person that will step up as a leader and have faith in God. Jesus told them, the uh, disciples when they, Jesus was preaching, actually he was preaching on metaphorically the bread and the wine and the blood and talking about drinking of his blood and eating of his flesh. And he had a whole crowd of followers and a bunch of them left. And the only ones that were there were the 12. They're the only ones that stayed. They said there were other disciples. I forget which chapter this is. I didn't write it down, but I just remember the story. He turns to the disciples and he says, are you... He said, are you going to leave too? Because Jesus was focused on doing whatever his father called him to do. And whether the 12 left or not, he was still going to do it. So that's the way you have to look at it. Don't look for a crowd. Jesus didn't look for a crowd. Just look. Um, wait, I put a rhyme in here, guys. Stop looking for a crowd and start looking to the clouds. Okay. Look to God. Am I pleasing you? If I'm pleasing you, I don't care how many people follow me. You know, there's that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. No none go with me. Still I will follow. Right? There's that part. So, that's what it's talking about. I want to have my steps ordered by God, not by what's popular. The majority of them didn't even have faith to go to battle. Remember, 22,000 of them left out of 32,000. So basically, two-thirds left. My math is not always great. You had 10,000 left, and God still said those weren't 
they weren't ready. They were a little too distracted. So we got to be, we got to understand, I'm not going to be scared. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be focused on me. I'm going to be focused on doing God's will, and I'm ready to go to battle. So now the last thing here, verse number eight, and then I'm going to read you the rest of the story, and then I'll, I will close out. So Gideon collected the provisions of ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them. Okay, so we said that night the Lord told him to get up and go down to the Midianite camp. Let's go to Judges 7.10. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. So Gideon took Pura and went down to the edge of the enemy's camp. The armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts, a bunch of bugs. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore, too many to count. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling a companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midian night camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, Your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite, the victory over Midian and all his allies. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshiped before the Lord. So he's thankful. He's praising the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. I said hordes. He divided the 300 men into three groups. Check this out. This is key. And gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar or a vessel. Some people know in the traditional translation, they say a vessel, an empty vessel with a torch in it. So they got three things. I got a ram's horn. I got a, an empty jar and I've got a torch in the jar. And then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. For when I come to the edge of the camp, just do, do just as I do. As soon as I and those who blow the ram's horn... Wait, as soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, you blow your horns too, all around the entire camp and shout for the, for the Lord and for Gideon are a sword. Wait, never mind. I'm reading. For the Lord and for Gideon, sorry. All right, so what do they have going on? Thanks for... Let's look at this. He told them to take a trumpet an empty vessel and a torch. So number eight, did I tell you, well, did I say what number eight was yet? Number eight is I must carry a fire and a sound of victory. I must carry a fire and a sound of victory. The trumpet meant a battalion. They rep, it represented I, I, in, in my studies in the past. It represented a battalion of 7,000 men. If you heard a trumpet blow, it meant 7,000 men. So when these trumpets blew, the enemies thought they were, they had about, was it 300 times 7,000? That's 20, wait, 210,000 people out there. What's the point of the, so that, that's a shout of victory. The victory shout we do as believers, it doesn't necessarily represent that we've already seen the victory. It's a victory shout that we know in our hearts that God has afforded us the victory and given it to us. So whether or not we see it yet, we're going to battle with a victory shout, right? So when you vocalize, that's the whole power of speaking and praising and thanking God. There's so much power in that. So when you praise God for something, when you haven't seen it yet, that's real faith right there. So he praised him. They, when they did that, they were... That was a victory. They were going in there with a victory shout, a victory mentality. And um, what's about what about the empty vessel that had fire in it? You are a vessel that carries the Spirit of God. You have to, what did they do? They broke that vessel and held the fires. The vessel was broken before the fire was shown. You have to put your flesh that you live in under before the fire of God can truly overpower you and rule your life. See, you your flesh is a you're in a flesh vessel, but the fire of the spirit must drive you. The fire of God must be what what breaks out of that flesh vessel and drives your everyday life, your everyday behavior and everything that you do. So, check this out. Let's finish reading it. It was just after midnight 
And, a, and after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp, suddenly they blew the ram's horn and broke the clay jars. Then all the groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Can I say something funny real quick? Because I know that's what everybody's here for. When I was at Maranatha Christian School, we had to sing this song for this fine art singing competition. Gideon blew his trumpet. He blew it loud and long. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon became their battle song. It had a pause just like that in there too. It's a terrible song. Each man stood, it sounded like it was written for like a, like a old movie or something. Anyways, each man stood his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horn, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Look, your praise confuses the enemy. The enemy will fall. He, he'll defeat himself. If you start praising God, you start shouting for victory, you start showing the fire of God in your life. <clears throat> Those who were not killed fled to palaces as far away as Beth, I'm not going to say that word, near Zerera, and to the border of Abel Mahola, near Taboth, to Bath. Then Gideon sent for the warriors of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, who joined in chasing the army of Midian, Gideon also sent messengers through the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down to attack the Midianites. Cut them off at the shallow crossings of the Jordan River and Beth Bera. So all the men of Ephraim did as they were told. So look, they had this whole freak out thing, panic in the camp, and the ones that escaped and weren't killed because they were killing each other started running away and then Gideon's men who were very few cut them off and uh and at a certain place on the path what did it say on the shallow crossings of the Jordan River they come across and attack them and this is the last verse they captured Oreb and Zeb the two Midianite commanders killing Oreb at the rock of Oreb <laughs> Got a rock named after him, but he was dead, though. It's a tombstone. And Zeb at the wine press of Zeb. To what took him to his, his own family business and, gave, and killed him. No, that's mob stuff right there. And they continued to chase the Midianites. Afterwards, the Israelites brought the heads. This I just wanted to keep this part in there. Brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan River. So... Some good Old Testament head chopping off stuff there, man. Good stuff. But what is my point here? At the end of the day, the fire of God on the inside of you with a broken vessel of your flesh that you said you've put under and decided your fire is going to rule and a shout of victory is going to win you the battle every time. You never let that fire burn out. You never let that passion burn out. You keep going after God and what he's called you to do. And you shout the victory and give him praise all the way through. Because if God is on your side, who can be against you? Believe what he said that nothing is impossible. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep pressing on. They had a fire that was a nation-saving, freedom-causing fire. Think about it. Your fire can shake a nation. Your fire, if it can shake a nation, it can shake a family, it can shake whatever you need shaking in your life. It can change people around you. It can cause freedom. That They had a fire that confused the enemy and a shout that confused the enemy and caused them to run. I'm telling you, when you get the fire of God on you and you get that shout of victory, the enemy is not going to want to mess with you. But if you want to walk around and be scared, you're an open target for him. That's why we got to stay alert and we got to stay ready. So listen, I hope you got something out of that. Um, I love that story of Gideon. There's so much in there. There's even more I didn't get to. There's a whole thing about a. You can read it yourself and tell me if you get something out of it. I'd love to know. But there's the whole fleece thing. There's the whole thing where he gives a sacrifice to an angel on accident. You go check that out if you want. That's in chapter six. But so much good stuff in two chapters here. But 
just you might be the least likely, but God, if God has called you and chosen you and he's called each and every one of us to do something, then get the fire on the inside of you and get a shout of victory and go in and do what God has called you to do. Amen. Manasseh. Yeah, I know. Um, not even going to talk about that right now, but here's what we're going to do, guys. I'm going to um, shift gears. I'm going to do this a little bit different. Uh, instead of praying over you, there's a prayer I'm going to play for you. I'm going to play the video. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. Maybe some of you have it. But we have an amazing announcement for Dominion Church in Sumter. And these are different ways you can give towards that. But we are going to... Um, no. I was going to name Sayla Manasseh because I heard this message one time and it was so good. And I forgot what it meant. But I was like, that would be a great name because... The way the message ended, it talked about how, uh, I forget who, who named, was it Joshua? Who named their kids Manasseh and another thing? I don't even remember. Somebody might know. Manasseh has some kind of meaning. Um, but I felt like it, it meant something to me that day and I was like teary eyed and, you know, then I realized that. I, there will be more tears shed when my daughter's getting picked on about being named Manasseh. So, but we are going in Dominion Church to su Sunday mornings on October 13th. We have one more service in our old location, 873 Woodcrest Street. And then now we are moving to a bigger facility and we'll be doing Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And uh, I have a video to show you before we close out this broadcast. So watch that. And if you want to give towards it, um, there'll be an opportunity for you guys to give towards that because this is a, a big step of faith for us and we'd love to have people partner with us and if, if you believe in our vision and, and if our ministry has affected you in any way, um, please consider and pray about um, giving towards it and helping us get this thing up and running the way that it needs to be. So God's gonna, we believe God's going to provide, but wait, I really feel led to name her Manasseh. I said, sir, pray. So, anyways, let me show you this video. It's exciting, and um, yeah, you guys are, um, you go on our Dominion Sumter page, or you can go on my personal page, and you can find this video by itself. Please share it so people can see it and know about what we're doing in Sumter. This is exciting stuff, so God bless y'all. Thanks for watching. Hey, guys, it's Pastor Corey from Dominion Church in Sumter with a very exciting announcement. I'm standing in front of a place that we'll be having church very shortly yes we are not only switching locations but we are switching times dominion church something we are going to sunday morning on october 13th we will be meeting here this is 515 north main street in sumter we'll be meeting right here on sunday mornings this is our new location 10 a.m we're going to be meeting on Sundays on the 13th. Let's let's take a look. Come on, let's take a look inside. Come with me. Come with me. Come with me. So this is, what is, this is where we're going to have our main service, our main sanctuary. Right here is where we're going to be meeting. We're going to load this place up with chairs. There's going to be an awesome band on that stage. Amen. We're preaching the word from up there. Nice chandelier. Can't beat a nice chandelier in church. And this place is super nice. So come this way. We'll check you in right here. There's some construction going on. There's some things we got to set up, but I'm excited. I wanted to show you. So come, come on, come on. So we're going to come this way. And uh, if you got kids, we're going to bring you this way. And we're going to take a portion of, of this room right here. It's going to be our kids' church. We also have, um, and yes, a lot of construction going on. So, so just, you know, we'll, it'll, it'll look kitty in a little bit. All right. Just tr trust me. Trust me here. So, and then you come down this way. We've got bathrooms and we've also got a room for infants. Uh, it, to, to do nurseries as well if you if you have a, uh, a little baby you want to bring to church, all right? So we're going to have awesome child care. Come back in here with me. And uh, we're going we're gonna to switch this place up. And this is going to be an awesome place for worship. So I'm excited to share with you guys that we're going to the next level. And with going to the next level, I want to give you guys an opportunity to, to sow into this vision. Because this is a big step of faith for us to go to this next level 
in ministry. But we believe in our message. We believe in Dominion Church's vision. We, we're thankful for Apostle Colin Meyer and sending us out here to Sumter and the vision that he, uh, God placed on his heart. And we're continuing that. And this is just the next step. We've got to go to the next level. Amen. We can't stay stagnant. So this will be a big deal. We're coming here on Sundays. We'll be even having Wednesday night service, midweek service here as well shortly. And we'll be announcing those things. But here's what I want to tell you. In the, in the uh, description, there's a way you can give. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign, Dominion Sumter. And um, we want, I want you to sow into this. If you believe in what um, me and my wife uh, have done in ministry, and you want to support us and support where this vision is going, if you believe in the vision of Apostle Kyle Meyer and Dominion Church, please pray about sowing a seed into this so we can get this thing started and get this thing moving in the right direction. Um, God's already done great things. We've seen salvations in the few short months we've been here. We've seen healings. We had a great move of the Spirit uh, last week, and we've had it plenty of times. This is only the ground floor of where we're going. But to get this going, we want to ask for your support. We want to ask for your partnership in this vision. So if you would, there's ways you can give online. In the, in the description, if you want to sow a seed, to us by mail, you can uh, send us a message and I will give you all that information. But this is an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God. We're not begging for money, we're moving forward with this no matter what happens. But if you wanna partner with us, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We put his kingdom first, everything we need will be added. I believe God will bless you significantly as you bless the kingdom. This is just the beginning of what God's gonna do. I'm asking you guys to be a part. If we've had any impact in your life, and if you believe in this vision, please pray about sowing a significant seed into this. And God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he reap. We'll put faith out there. And I'm going to pray for you right now before we close out this broadcast. And we'll pray for where we're going here at Dominion Sumter. Father God, we thank you for everyone watching right now. We pray for those that sow seeds today. Lord, I thank you that you will, um, you said, give and it shall be given. And you will abound in their accounts, Lord. I thank you right now. They'll be blessed. The windows of heaven open over their life. And that you you just pour out a blessing they can't contain. Lord, I thank you right now as we partner together that you're going to knit our hearts together. And that you're going to do a significant thing here in Sumter, Lord. We thank you right now in advance that the city of Sumter will be ministered to for, for all ages, all races, all types of people. From Morris College to... Uh, the other colleges here in town to Shaw Air Force Base and, and all the surrounding cities like Cherryville and Dalzell and the others. Lord, I thank you right now. This is just the beginning of what you're going to do in this city, Lord. We thank you in advance for a move of God, for souls saved, for healings, miracles, signs and wonders happening in this room and in some group. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for watching and thank you for your support in advance.